Good morning, viewers. It's been a very long time since I last dropped a video on this um, channel, and that's because I've been extremely busy. But it's good to be back. And um, this time, because we do not have plenty of time, especially for my students in the University of Benin who will be taking their exams very soon, I'll be making this um, video very short. I'll be talking about hybridization, but the focus will be on um, easy ways of knowing what kind of hybridization is present in a particular compound. Before we begin, I'd like to tell us first what hybridization is. By definition, we say that hybridization is the mixing of atomic orbitals to form hybrid orbitals. What that means is, before hybridization, the orbitals may be described as unhybridized. However, after hybridization, the orbitals become what we call hybrid orbitals. Now, an interesting thing about hybridized and unhybridized orbitals is the fact that before hybridization, the orbitals that mix usually have different energies as well as different shapes. But after mixing, the orbitals become identical in energy, in shape, and otherwise. So hybridization makes orbitals uniform, such that you could have A mixing with B, and in the end you get what we call, or what we may call, AB. AB is a hybrid. This hybrid has some properties of A, some properties of B, and some properties of its own. So that's hybridization, mixing of atomic orbitals, so as to get new orbitals that we call hybrid orbitals that are of equal energy. Now the hybridization in um, compounds is usually a function of atoms. What I mean is um, we do not necessarily talk about the hybridization of a compound. Instead, it may be more appropriate to talk about the hybridization of a particular atom in a compound. How we determine hybridization, I'll show you by some shortcuts, by some easy methods. However, in the long run, I'll um, show you, if possible, if time allows, how I came about those um, shortcuts. But for now, how do we determine hybridization in a compound? I'll get to that soon. But see this, see the list of different types of hybridization, different possible hybrid orbitals that we have in atoms in a compound. There's the sp, sp2, sp3. Now in organic compounds where carbon is the main ingredient, where carbon is the main element present, the type of hybridization you see is sp or sp2 or sp3. For everything below that line, they are usually not found in organic compounds because carbon cannot go beyond the first line. So on this side, I'll tell you about hybridization in organic compounds and you'd expect that our results will not go beyond the first line. However, speaking generally, especially in inorganic chemistry, when other elements become involved, then we can have a whole lot of different types of um, hybridization or hybrid orbitals. But for relevance sake and for the fact that um, many of these videos are for students in college or secondary school, I won't go beyond the content of the box. So I'll tell you about the content of the box. I'll tell you how to know when a compound has any of these as its um, hybridization type for the central atom in inorganic compounds and then for the carbon atoms in organic compounds. So let's go straight to business. How do we determine um, hybridization in an organic compound? One organic compound that has only one carbon is methane, CH4. And in methane, we have um, a particular type of hybridization out of this list. Of course, I'm believing that you're guessing already that it's one of the top three. Because we said for organic compounds, they would usually not come down here. So for methane, yes, it will be one of these three eventually. But beyond methane, most of our organic compounds have more than one carbon. So for those organic compounds that have more than one carbon, to know their hybridization, you would need to talk about the hybridization of each carbon. So let's leave a three carbon chain here. Consider this three carbon chain. If you were to talk about hybridization in this compound, you talk about hybridization in this carbon, then that carbon, then the last carbon. 
So we talk about hybridization in the carbon atoms themselves, not necessarily in the entire compound. Now, how do we know what kind of hybridization occurs in a compound like this? See how we go about it. You would look at the full structure of the compound. Let's say the compound is drawn like this. Let me add two more carbons so that everything goes down with this one compound. Yes, so I have this now. This is a complete compound, well drawn, with five carbons and, of course, these are hydrogen atoms, so three, four, five, and six. So that's C5 and H6. Now, for this compound I have drawn, you may wonder what kind of hybridization do we have at the different carbons. Remember we said that for organic compounds, the possibilities are sp, sp2, and sp3. If we expand these, sp remains s and p. sp2 is s, p, and p. sp3 is s, p, p, and p. So that if you count the number of items on those three lines, for S and P, we have total number of items, 2. SPP, 3. SPPP, 4. So which means, to get an SP3 hybrid, if I show you this and I say this is an SP3 hybrid, it will mean that this hybrid orbital was formed by the mixing of four orbitals. And of those four orbitals, one of them is an S and the other three are P's. What would it mean to say that this orbital here, this hybrid orbital, is SP? It means that this orbital you are looking at first is a hybrid orbital, so it's not the unhybridized orbital, it's a hybrid, it's a mixture of two things, or more than two things. But because we said SP, S, P, O, which means an S orbital and a P orbital mixed together to form this guy. By the way, let me quickly mention that when an S orbital mixes with three P orbitals, you know we have four orbitals mixing. They don't mix to give one. They mix to give four. So the number of orbitals remains the same, but their nature changes. So which means an S orbital mixes with three P orbitals to give us four sp3 hybrids so each of them is an sp3 hybrid sp3 hybrid like that all right so it means that the sp3 hybridization involves the mixing of four orbitals and when you see a compound like this just ask yourself this carbon atom i am focusing on at the moment how many direct neighbors does it have if your answer is two then the carbon is sp if your answer is 3, then the carbon is sp2. And if your answer is 4, then the carbon is sp3. How do we mean? Look at this carbon. How many direct neighbors does it have? Let's count. This is 1, that's 2, that's 3, and that's 4. So this carbon is attached to H, to H, to H, and to that C. Those are the four neighbors it has. Therefore, this carbon can be said to be sp3 hybridized. What about the next carbon? This one. For this next carbon, you see that it has only three neighbors, which are H down here, to the left C, to the right C, but up there it has nothing. So it has only three neighbors, and that makes this carbon sp2. What about the next? I'm sure you're guessing sp2 already, and that's correct. So it's sp2 because that carbon has 1, 2, and 3 as neighbors. So that makes it sp2. Now look at the next carbon. What do you notice about it? It has how many neighbors now? Just two. With two neighbors, we would say that that carbon is sp. And then the last carbon. If you have guessed sp, yes, that would be very correct. So we have sp3, sp2, sp2. SP, SP. So it's easy and um, you may be correct to think that where you have a double bond, you expect SP2 hybridization and where you have a triple bond, you expect SP3 hybridization. But not that easily, my friend. I'll look at this compound. Look at this one. Let's see this compound together. Let's say we have a compound like this. Beautiful. See that compound now. For the compound on board right now, if you were asked for the hybridization in this carbon, 
because it is flanked by double bonds, carbon to carbon double bonds, you may be tempted to say sp2. But no, that carbon is sp. And it's easier to get that very correctly using number of neighbors. We've said here that two neighbors would mean sp. So it means that for this carbon, the carbon with an asterisk there, it would be sp because the only two neighbors it has are the two carbons by its side. Nothing down and nothing up. So this carbon is sp. These ones are sp2. And then those ones are sp3. So for organic compounds, it's that easy. Just count number of neighbors. Two neighbors, sp3 neighbors, sp2. And then four neighbors, sp3. So it's that easy for organic compounds. Now let's get down to the major part of this video, the major part of the work, which is hybridization in inorganic compounds. Now for inorganic compounds, let's say we are given a compound like um, AX3. This is an inorganic compound now. Usually this A is referred to as the central atom. We call it the central atom to which all the three X's are attached. So it says we have something like A, X, um, X, and X, something like that. So the A is considered the central atom, and then these ones are the attached atoms. Now, usually, when we talk about hybridization in a compound like AX3, it is the hybridization in the central atom that we are concerned about. So some persons may ask you the question as, what is the hybridization in AX3? But those who pay attention to details may say, what is the hybridization of A in AX3? However the question comes, just know that for inorganic compounds, our focus is usually on the central atom. Now having said that, having talked about the fact that our focus is on the central atom, I would like to tell you that to get the hybridization in a compound is quite easy, an inorganic compound, very easy. I'll show you a shortcut. This shortcut says hybridization type, um, okay, let's do it this way, number of electron pairs equals D plus U. Uh, let's see, plus A and minus C. Plus A and minus C. What do we mean by this? What are the parameters in this formula? D plus U plus A and minus C. Sorry, there's um, half into that. So we're dividing all of that by 2. Of course, I don't need to tell you what 1 over 2 is. That's half. But D, D stands for number of electrons around the central atom. So once you have identified the central atom, the number of electrons in its outermost shell, that's what D stands for. Then U, U stands for the number of univalent atoms attached. Number of univalent atoms attached. When we say univalent atoms, we mean mainly hydrogen and then halogens. So if we have hydrogen and halogens attached to a compound, yes, those are the univalents. So let's quickly put one compound here so that it can help us, or better still, two compounds. Consider B, H3, and SO2. So that as we analyze this formula or list the components of this formula, we are able to apply them to this. So let's say I also add SO4, 2 minus. Beautiful. SO4, 2 minus. So look at these three. Let me use them to explain this. So in the first case, D is number of electrons around the central atom. Central atom here is boron. There it is sulfur. And in the last case, it's sulfur. Number of electrons around boron. Uh, boron is in the same group as aluminum. And what it has outside is three. For sulfur, number of electrons outside six. Just like oxygen, it's congener. And then solve for here, 6. So I've written the D's in each of those cases. The next thing will be 
univalent. Hydrogen is univalent. So I have three of it attached to the central atom. So let's the number of univalent attached to the central atom, all right? So since H is univalent and I have three of it present, I'll say plus three. But on this side, oxygen is divalent. So I'm not adding anything here, or better still, I'll say there are zero univalent. Then in this case as well, I'll say plus zero univalence because oxygen is divalent. So what are A and C? A, anion. A stands for anions and that means negative charges. Negative charges. All right? Whereas C stands for cations and that means positive charges. Now, how do we apply those two? Negative charges, positive charges. If you look at BH3, it has no charge at all. So, no A and no C. And that means everything about this bracket for BH3 is just 3 over 3, which is 6. And when you take half of that, 6 divided by 2, it gives us 3. In the case of SO2, in the case of SO2, 6 plus 0 is 6. Because there is no charge, we end up at 6, and when we divide that by 2, we get 3. But for SO4, we have 6 plus 0 already, but do we have any negative charges? Yes, total negative charge is 2. So I'm going to say plus total negative charge 2, because here it says add negative charges and subtract positive charges. So that at the end of the day, this becomes 8 over 2, and that is 4. Now, these answers we've obtained, how do we interpret them? The same way we did before. 3 stands for sp2, 3 stands for sp2, and 4 stands for sp3. So, sp2, sp2, sp3. Those are our results. By the way, I should mention, I already did though, that sp is 2, sp2 is what? 3, then sp3 is 4, but take note that sp3d is 5, and sp3d2 is 6, then there's sp3d3, and that is 7. So which means anytime we calculate number of electron pairs, we usually expect our answer to range between 2 and 7. And depending on the answer we get from that calculation, we can predict the hybridization in a compound. So that's how to get the hybridization in an inorganic compound. You just do this maths and you are okay. Um, let me show us one more example here, very quickly. Let's say we have something like um, ICl3. This is an interhalogen compound now. Around iodine, which is the central atom, we have seven plus these are univalent, three of them, so that gives us ten. Ten divided by two gives us five. Five, according to our table, means sp3d. So it means that in ICl3, iodine is sp3d hybridized. So that's how to get the hybridization of the central atom in a compound. Don't forget your formula and don't forget the meanings of the parameters. We'll go on a short break and when we return from that break, I'll show you a next part of this same hybridization. Geometry versus shape. It's very important that you view this second part because that's where you get plenty information. Things that they ask you, especially in the advanced levels, are all about geometry and shape. Yeah, it may not be enough to know, oh, in iodine um, trichloride, ICL3, iodine is sp3d hybridized. Yeah, what's the geometry of that molecule? What's the shape? It's very important that you know the shape. Is it trigonal planar? No. Is it trigonal pyramidal? No. Trigonal bipyramidal, you understand, seesaw, T-shaped. There are many possibilities, things that some of us may not have heard all the while. So I'll tell us in that video the different types of geometry and the different types of shapes that molecules could have. And very importantly, how geometry differs from shape. 
So I'll see us after the break. <laughs> 